I just spent the morning on Sora, actually. <laughs> and I couldn't believe <laughs> the amount of uh, imagery that is, and you can just see the things that people are producing and the detail and clarity. And it feels to me like it's going to be incredibly hard for some of the, I don't know, facial recognition that we're employing these days to be able to keep up with what's coming there. I mean, how, how are you seeing authentication evolving? I mean, voice, I mean, any of these kind of two-factor forms that may not necessarily, may have worked in the past and may have felt impervious, but, yeah. but with the modern development of AI, I don't know. What, do you, what, what are you saying? I mean, what, not to mention all the other, obviously, the, all the other threats that are, that are now optimized. But what, what do you see is happening in, in your industry with regard to the kind of AI moment? Yeah. So I think there's a couple of aspects to it, one of which is like the platforms themselves, right? So like Apple, Microsoft, you know, they're working a lot on technologies to secure identities and really to secure the the systems and, and the devices, right? And we get to leverage that because now there's open standards that employ Touch ID and Face ID and all these things. And those technologies are continuing to improve, right? So like the, the ability to hack a Touch ID from 10 years ago is fundamentally different than the ability to hack you know, a face or a Touch ID now with all the data points and you know IR cameras and scanning surfaces and spoofing those things is becoming more and more difficult. But they're constantly keeping up or, you know, having to keep up with AI generated things and, and even the ability to like print out 3D print out faces. And it's like, can I print out someone's face and then use that as a face ID? That's, a, that's a concern, right? That's a real thing. So we have to, you know, rely on these platforms wholeheartedly. Like you have to like completely say, yep, I'm going to buy into the fact that Apple is doing their best to to make their piece of the technology as secure as possible. And then I get to leverage that through open standards like FIDO and WebAuthn and, and other technologies and, you know, GNIP and, you know, all the new technologies that are coming out or GNAP. Yeah. Um, so there's a ton of that going on. And then in our space, we also see the, you know, AI in different aspects as well, where it's like, we're seeing people leverage AI to write their applications, right? Because, you know, we're, we're a dev tool. And so people are saying like, you know, having a prompt like, hey, Copilot, write me an integration with an OAuth provider or like write me an integration with FusionOn. And so we have to optimize our tactics of providing information so that they are AI friendly. And no one really knows how the AI is figuring this stuff out or how to optimize for AI. So it's like a kind of a guessing game. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. So as a developer, you um, certainly, I'm sure, have noticed <laughs> that, 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 uh, that code can be created incredibly competently and, and remarkably quickly uh, through uh, artificial intelligence and, and, and the chat GPT models that are out there. Um, and and it's been our sense here at Solutions Review that that is that is going to have a significant impact on developers, um, particularly junior developers. It's almost like the the rungs of the ladder that everybody used to climb up and become eventually a CEO. I I, I mean, almost all the CEOs I talked to on this podcast started out as a developer, as a junior coder, mm -hmm. just grinding code and learning fundamental atomic, you know, movements of, of computer science. And, and, and that feels like it's potentially going to go away in short order um, through artificial intelligence and large language models and all the code that can be created now and certainly with agents and so forth. So where do you see it going? And what do you believe is the impact uh, on the community, the, com the coder community? So my son is actually uh, up at CU studying computer engineering, computer science, exact same degree I got. And we talk about this a lot, right? Because he's, he's trying to figure out, like, how do I get a job? And it looks like doomsday out there for these folks that are graduating from engineering, you know, or CS or whatever, trying to find a job if that AI is just doing the code that they would have normally done. And so I told him, I was like, 
take some AI courses, right? Like learn how these things work and learn how to build the next generation of them and then you're going to have a job. But the, the other aspect of it is, is learn what's good code and bad code, right? Because AI can generate a for loop just like the, the rest of us. But is it going to generate the for loop that can run on the hard, you know, like some embedded piece of hardware that needs to do 40 gigabit per second network transfers? No, of course not. Like a human is going to be required to figure that out and optimize that piece of code that it, you know, the AI generated. So there's still going to be human components of this to optimize. And you can't optimize unless you know what's good and bad. Right, you have to know your fundamentals in terms of data structures and um, you know pointers and memory management and all these things. Like you have to know all this in order to be the person that generates the best prompts and then spit out the code and then check make sure the code is actually the best code that it could be. Right, so we're going to need engineers, in my opinion, for a very long time. But they're just the next level of engineers. They're they're the engineers that know the tooling and know the AI and know how to optimize for things. That's my personal view of you know, how the engineers are gonna stay relevant. Well, well let's keep going down that uh, perspective, having uh, a son in college. Because do you believe that the university system is capable of staying in tune with this rapidly evolving uh, technology? Because I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think they are the least equipped <laughs> to, to recognize what's coming. And quite frankly, I think they're in the crosshairs as, as, as much as anybody. I think it's it's kind of the same stack ranking that we used to use for colleges like, you know, U.S. News and World Report. Right. So if you look at MIT and you look at the way that they're approaching AI and that they're you know thinking about it, it's going to be very, quite different than if you look at, you know, uh, Metropolitan State College of Denver, right? So there's going to be grades of the way that their faculty understand and have helped create the algorithms that AI is using, right? So CU happens to be one of those schools that act, has a very strong AI, NLP, and ML program. Um, and they have, you know, PhD programs that people have done, you know, pretty, pretty amazing things at. And so, and they're also a research school. So I think it's going to come down to school by school basis, very similar to the way it used to be, right? So like you would go to certain schools just for networking if you were interested in networking. Um, you would go to school at you know, CU and get a PhD if you were interested in like natural language processing. So that's kind of the, I think there are some schools that are going to fall way behind and some schools that are going to keep up, unfortunately, but yeah. Well, zoom out even further um, and, and out, out of the computer science department and into just colleges and universities in general, I mean, it, it feels to me like their unique selling proposition has always been, well, we have knowledge that you don't have. Yeah. And we have professors who can deliver that to you that you can't access unless you pay us for that. And, and so you sit in a room and we download <laughs> to a whole sea of you. And that feels to me like that is, that is indefensible in, in, in where we're headed, completely indefensible. Good teachers are going to continue to allow students to learn faster than they can learn on their own. Right. So, you know, just think of the best teacher you had, you know, in college, high school, whatever it was, right. They inspired you. They actually like made you want to learn and create things and do all those things. Even maybe in a subject that you absolutely hated or just like had no interest in it. That's where teachers really shine, right? We've all had bad teachers and they've all just, you know, oh my God, I remember this, you know, story of the, my chemistry teacher and I couldn't learn a thing from it. I got to go, I had to go teach myself. Yeah, I think, I, I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of people who started a lot of companies because of that teacher. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so we've had online learning and the ability like Khan Academy, we've had so much information out there in the world in well digestible formats, right? Like things like videos and like people walking you through step by step. And some people learn really well because they're hyper motivated to go learn that on their own. And then there's the flip side of that where the there are people who just 
aren't, and they need that shepherd. They need that help, that teacher at those universities to present it to them. So do they though? This is where, I, the, uh, so I'm going to push you on that one. Do they, do they need that now? I mean, do they need, or, or, or is that antiquated as well that you can recreate that person in, in, in perfect form in short order through avatars and perfectly tuned. I mean, won't we all just have our perfect teacher eventually in a virtual space? Potentially. Uh, yeah. If they can, if we can tune it to your learning style and provide them the content in a manner that you digest the best, 100%. But how far are we from that? Right. And yeah. Right. And, and is that's why you're here, but like, there's still the human interaction of going to a place of learning and being inspired by the learning of it, as well as the tactile things that you get to do where you get to take a, a 8086 CPU and put it on a breadboard. Like there's still pieces of this that are, are, are in person. Like, you know, we, like, I think that the shift to online learning was actually a detriment to most learning. I think going in person and having somebody sit next to you and write things or show you how to put resistors into a breadboard, like those things are still going to exist. So I'm, I'm not, I'm much less of a doomsday or, you know, AI or than I think a lot of people, I look at AI as a tool, not as a panacea. It's, it, it doesn't solve problems. It's a, it's a tool to help us solve problems, but without people to use the tool and to know how to use the tool effectively, it's the same state that we're currently in. There's information's everywhere, right? It's just we're using a tool to help us accelerate our learning or to accelerate our code generation or our, our doing a task. 